We want to bless God again for such a wonderful day that we have to share his word. And for those who have been following us, it's very welcome to hear that baby's voice. It's a sign of life. It means we are doing well. It means our life is not barren when you hear babies cry. When you go to churches and you don't hear the voice of babies cry and things falling around and making noise, you have to be careful why that church is so sterile. <laughs> Amen. So for those who have been following us, we have been uh, studying from the book of Peter's. We're talking about the advice that the apostle Peter gave to us on, in adding on virtues to ourselves in working out our ways diligently. I'll read again so that those who may be joining for the first time will know the passage uh, that we have been working with. We've been working with uh, 2 Peter's chapter 1. Um, We'll, we'll be reading all the way to verse 15, but today we're going to stop on verse 8. And it says, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly <coughs> kindness charity. For if these things are in you, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we are going to be talking about adding to our godliness brotherly kindness. Um, I'm hoping that I can finish this one today. If not, then we can break it up into two parts. So for us to be able to talk about brotherly kindness, we have to be willing to first of all, acknowledge the fact that Christ has already talked about the idea of the only two valid commandments, loving God with our heart, with our soul, with our mind, with everything that we are as the main commandment and the second commandment, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so it is out of this that the idea of loving a brother comes. If the essence of love by itself is inexistent, it is impossible to be able to draw out something from where you don't have and attempt to give to somebody who is in need. And so I believe that the place to address the issue of brotherly kindness or brotherly love begin, should begin from the situation where Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, guys, what I discovered as I started to study this particular virtue is this, that the idea of brotherly kindness is the main virtue in the process of the sanctification of a Christian. If you, if you look at it carefully with me, the way you can tell whether a Christian is going properly through the process of sanctification is by his ability to apply, exploit the idea of brotherly kindness in his life. And you will all agree. So this is a good test for everybody before we even go too far. If I am in one of those places as a Christian where I cannot tolerate brothers or brethren for some reason that may be valid to me, and I choose to live that hermit Christian life, I won't bother you, just don't bother me. I will just live my life, I will read my scripture, I will praise God, and when I'm done, I go my way. If you find yourself in any way in that spectrum of relationship, I can tell you today that your sanctification process is not right. It's not going the right way. It is not bearing the fruit. It suddenly hit me that this is the virtue of virtues. Although it seems like, wait a minute, 
Because when I was looking at it, I've done this now three times. That's why I think I would like you guys to hear the second and the third versions. It's very important. I realize in the first instance, why is it so important for me to love a brother as an aspect of my growing? Why is it so important? How can't I just love God, right? Pay my tithes, offerings, take care of my children, avoid sexual immoralities. How, how shouldn't that just be enough? Well, it's easy to do those things. Then I realized that one of the reasons that the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself, is that the moment you begin to allow somebody else enter into your sphere, the game changes. It's one thing to have guests in your house and feed them lunch. You feed them that they think, wow, this man loves me so much. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, eat as much as you want because I can hardly wait for you to go home. <laughs> it's the truth. But the idea of brotherly kindness is not only should you eat as much as you want, move into my space. That's where the rubber meets the road. And the moment I am now having difficulty in sharing my space, in sharing my time, in feeling broken because somebody has entered into my cycle, that is where the test for my sanctification comes. That's where I realize, yes, we have done the sermon. This is the third time I've made this type of sermon. I realized that something was typically missing. And what is missing is that we need to understand that except we realize that brotherly kindness is the virtue of virtues that helps me to test my sanctification if it is proper or not. It's important. So dear friend, this is why I think it is important for you and I to hold on to this message. The Lord in chapter 12 of the book of Matthew, verses 30 to 31 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the second. Love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no commander, commandment greater than these. It's very important as I meditated on this particular passage that the Lord Jesus gave us, so many other questions arose in my mind. And simply put, what does it mean to love a neighbor? Now, I, I, I now see the difference why Christ was saying it. Let me tell you this. In our normal human experience, many times what we call loving our neighbor, do you guys have a definition for it? I call it selective and convenient affinity. Isn't that true? Other people's children are dirty, they are stinky, right? But when your kid is messy, it's your child. You do it lovingly anyway. There are so many habits we don't tolerate in other people. But when we see it in our children, I have never seen creatures as biased as humans. The things that I would not tolerate in a church member, in a ship in my church, where I'll be pounding the word for him or her on the table, I see it in my son, I'm careful so she does, he doesn't feel rejected. When I'm making the truth known to him or her, I'm saying it in such a way that he can still remember Dad loves me, although he may not be, what he may be saying right now may not be so kind to me, but he loves me. But when I'm saying it to other people, I throw away all caution. We all do it. And this is why we need to be careful in our experience that what we call love for the brother is truly love. If it is simply selective and convenient affinity, then it is not love enough. And the evidence in the fact is how quickly we give up on the people that we invest in emotionally, spiritually, physically, 
when they fail us. How easy it is to look to write somebody off to say, I used to think he was a holy man. He's just like all of them. The moment you find yourself in that place where you write somebody off so quickly, your sanctification process is not okay. Brother, brother, I wanted to speak Romanian. Brother Tony, what are you saying? Have you ever seen a person that punishes themselves when you get to their house? Why are you on your knee? I'm on my knee because I looked at a girl the wrong way. Have you ever seen it? Never. Have you ever seen somebody who gets a tip and tips up their mouth and ties their hand? Why are you tying it up? Well, because I'm punishing myself from, for because I, I committed gluttony. Have you seen it? No. Instead, we make excuses for ourselves. We give ourselves forgiveness. Guys, what I want you to see is that this virtue is extremely important because what the scripture is telling me here is this. If I love myself, that same model is what I need to place upon my brother and my neighbor. That's what is called love. It's not in selective or convenient affinity. When it comes to people, the people we choose to give unconditional love, guys, can you guess whom we give it to first of all? Ourselves, our children, maybe sometimes our wives or our husband, depending on how the marriage is. We give them unconditional love. So you want to see that I, 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 you guys will say, Brother Tony, you are very right today. By the time I came to come to conclusion, one of the things I have found out is that when the process of sanctification is impeded, that means it's overthrown, it's not allowed to get to its profitable end, there's something always wrong in the life of that saint. Even though there may be no obvious sin that people can see. Because the idea of loving a brother or a neighbor is ingrained in God's spirituality because God is love. And so the moment I find myself hating a neighbor, which I really wish I have the privilege to hate my neighbor, because sometimes it feels good to hate your neighbor. I'm not pretending here. I feel good if I hear that my neighbor runs into trouble that has hurt me, although I know it is sinful and I reject it in my life. But I'm saying that once I find myself finding pleasure in those negativity towards my neighbor, my sanctification process naturally will suffer. And so we can even stop here today and then analyze ourselves. If our life is not going the way it should go, then something is wrong. We already know where. Our children, because they come out of us, we don't, we don't condition it. Our wives, because they have something to offer us. Our parents, because we came out from them. Or the people of our ethnic group. Or the color that we look like. The real test for all of this is how we react when they do not meet our standard. We have to set them in place. Let me talk about selective or convenient affinity. My reaction when the recipient of my love no longer meets my standard is what tells me whether my love is real or not. It is what tells me whether I am able to love my brother or my neighbor as myself. Is it is what tells me if it is simply convenient or simply selective affinity. You know, when I the more I I use this word that Jesus said, I feel so. I don't know if it's a feeling of anger or a feeling of brokenness that goes through me, love my enemy as myself, my neighbor as myself. It's like something just rips in my mind. It's not that I am bitter. It's because I am now realizing more and more that my process of sanctification is in jeopardy as long as I hold on to my selective or convenient affinity in loving people. 
It's not that there is bitterness in me. Hear this. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus puts it so interesting. He says, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your father in heaven. Guys, can you see what he said? It was said in the beginning, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But guys, let's look at this passage together. Verse 44, it says, but I tell you, love your enemies. Oftentimes, this is why people can't love their enemies. Because we stop there. If you stop there, of course, who wants to love their enemies? Nobody should. But if you read it to the end, pray for those who persecute you. Why? See the answer. So that you may be the children of your father in heaven. Guys, we can do a mathematical extrapolation. Love your enemy and pray for them is equal to keeping your status as children of God. For you to keep your nature as the children of God, you must be willing to love and pray for your enemy and those who persecute you. Therefore, you will keep your nature as a child of God. Why? Because your inability to love and pray for your enemy and those who persecute you will erode from the authenticity of you being a child of God. Guys, can you see what I'm saying? So your authenticity of being a child of God can be hindered by your unwillingness to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. It's so painful. I want to pull my hair that I don't have, but the truth is very obvious. The truth is very obvious. Are you still following? Our love for those who love us because we derive something from them must match our love for those who may never be in the position of meeting our standard at all. That's the real test. The way I love my son should be the way I love the son of my enemy. It's very interesting. Now I know it's not just Christ is just saying some willy nilly thing. He's saying it because my inability to love my neighbor's enemy's son has the instrumentation to rip the fabric of my authentic nature as a child of God. If there is anything that can hinder the integrity of me being a child of God, it is hating my enemy. Hate is like spiritual acid. It can burn your clothing spiritually and burn your ability to be a child of God. True lovers, do not get me wrong, dear friends. Many saints who respond positively to the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are so many of them who can do what, I'm, what Jesus is saying. And I am trying to be one of them. My true desire is to help us evaluate where we stand when it comes to this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then have brotherly kindness. Let's look at this passage. First John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. First John chapter 2, we're going to read all and we'll break it down. And I will show you something in this particular passage. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates a brother or sister is where? What did the scripture say? Is still in the darkness. Verse 10, anyone who loves their brother and sisters lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or a sister is in the dark and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because darkness has blinded them. Let me read this other passage before we go further. 
In 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, if we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. Guys, you can now begin to see, begin to see why this virtue is a virtue of virtues. Why is brotherly love a virtue? Someone could say afterwards, if I stay away from people and just worship God, I don't have to spend energy in loving the brethren. And I've seen a lot of saints like that. If you have ever seen such saints, I can tell you one characteristics. One, one they are always confused. People who don't like to mix with other people, they are always confused. Always confused, and you will see why. Here it is. For us to answer this question, we must understand the meaning of brotherly love. Brotherly love comes from that Greek word adelphos. It basically means to have an affinity for the brethren. In other words, my propensity in relationship should be towards the brethren. And it must, it, it, and if I must do good to people, I should prioritize the brethren. Now, what I want you to see that the Bible didn't do is the Bible did not differentiate what type of brethren here, right? It says the brethren, the ones that like backbite you, the ones that try to derail you, the ones that are jealous of you, the ones that do things to you, to slow you down. It just says, love them. Hear this. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, it says, let us not be weary in doing good. Why? For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Friends, let me give you a few things before we uh, get to the end of this sermon. First thing is this. If anyone agrees, you will see that when we enter into relationship with people, it usually may not turn out with what we expect. Relationships don't always turn out the way you want. This is why Willingness to obey the idea of loving your brother as yourself is important. The reason is simple. If I don't make a resolve from the beginning to love my enemy, it will interact with my process of sanctification. That's the first thing. People will disappoint us. They will betray us. They will hurt us or do whatever to us. Although the tendency then may be what? To run away. Who wants to be with a gossiping brother? Nobody. We want to run away from such relationship or even reject it completely. Yet those relationships, they may be what we call the proper markers for whether we are being sanctified or not. So this is what I want you to see. If you want to test whether your process of sanctification and transformation from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ is going well, test your brotherly kindness. Check it out. Check out your ability to love. Check it out. If you have the tendency to run and shield, then you probably want to slow down to fix the problem. Before I go too far, I don't want somebody to say, Frank Brother Tony is just asking me to kill myself and expose myself. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you shouldn't be wise. I'm just saying, if you can't love, your sanctification is a problem. It's, it's, it's a jeopardy. It's, there's no two way to it. I'm not saying don't be friendly. I'm not saying if, if you know that a brother is a thief, Lock your 
safe when it comes to your house and keep your pocket in your pocket. <laughs> you don't need to deal with that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying like this, that my ability to love my brother as myself has the capacity of interacting with the process of my sanctification. The degree to which a saint is willing to expose himself or herself to brethren in relationship may reveal how far sanctified that individual is. That's very important. So it doesn't mean you are not a child of God. It's a good measure. Am I going the right direction? Am I where I want to be in Christ? That will tell. If you are that type that doesn't like white people in your church, okay, just know that you have gone this far. If you are that type that doesn't love to mix with poor people in the programs, it's okay, it's your choice. Just know that you have gone this far. Your willingness to interact actually is going to be able to tell you this is how far you have gone. There's also something you need to hear. Adding brotherly kindness to your virtue is not just for the benefit of the fellow kingdom brother. Because when you read it, adds to your virtue brotherly kindness. It seems like, let me contribute. That's what it looks like. But that's not the whole idea. It's actually to my advantage in my spiritual work. Why? The Lord knows man and the heart of man. He understands that we may not quickly understand ourselves as he knows us. And this is to say that he is not ignorant that some relationship may not be easy. There will be people in the church that you will have to find a way around the relationship with in your office, in the marketplace. They are not easy people to deal with. God is not ignorant of such people, but he expects us to participate because of the benefit that will accrue to us. Let me show you the first thing. In John chapter 14, verse 21, in obeying this commandment, hear this, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Can I read it again? John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is who? Can you finish the phrase for me? Is the one? <laughs> Did you guys ever think of that? That whoever obeys me in loving their brother or their neighbor is the one who really loves me. Number two, the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and I will reveal myself to such a person. Let me break it down. Although relationship with the brethren may not be easy, yet obeying the Lord and loving our brethren will release a set of phenomenal blessings in the life of such a saint. Let us look at them. Number one, such a person will be loved by the father. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. If you obey this commandment, Papa God will love you. Which means you have a friend in high place. <laughs> Papa God will love you. I, I, sometimes one of the things I've noticed in the life of saints is some people have not, sometimes you just want that big daddy squeeze. You feel his love. Some people have never experienced it. And I know why a lot of people have not. When you hate the brethren, your sanctification is impeded. God cannot hug you that way. Number two, the Lord Jesus will love such a saint. Isn't that ironic that God, Jesus Christ, who's supposed to be love and die for everybody, is making a difference? <laughs> that if you obey me, I will love you. <clears throat> So when you hear that unconditional love that sometimes people want us to hear and we are breaking the law, we are deceiving ourselves. It says here, if you keep my commandment, if you obey them, <coughs> my father will love you and I will love you. But what is so important and interesting is that 
I will reveal myself to you. I will let you figure me out. I will let you hear from me. I will show you the intricacies of this life that seems so complicated at this point in time. It's important. When you look at the life of people who have been afflicted with hate and bitterness, one of the things you will find in oppression in their lives is confusion. Because you are constantly thinking, Lord, I can understand. Why me? Why did this happen? They are always conflicted. They are not sure whether the Lord loves them or not. Well, this is the answer. The problem is simple. They are not in obedience. Because when you are in obedience, in loving your neighbor or your brother as yourself, automatically, God will show his love. Jesus will show his love and he will reveal himself to you. Let's go on. We're building up. John 14, 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. This is the big one. We will come to him and make our home with him. Who wants to have the father, the son, and the spirit as a neighbor in their house? Guys, do you see what I'm saying? Jesus is saying, if you obey my commandment, not only will my father love you, we will come to you and we will bring our whole essence into your home. Maybe homes where there is no love, it's because the father, the son, and the spirit are not there. Maybe because love it's not operational, and therefore the Trinity cannot move. Just hear this. We will come to him and make our home with him. What an incredible promise to have the Trinity visit and stay with you. If saints understand this truth, the idea of brotherly kindness will not be a problem. The process of sanctification can be hindered. First John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. We're going to break it down. It says, if anyone claims to be in the light, but hates a brother or a sister, such a person is still in the dark. Where hate rules, this is what I want you to hear. Darkness will reign. And the process of sanctification will not take place where we fail to participate in the life of the brethren because we have become embittered, darkness will impose itself upon us. I want you guys to hear this. Darkness does not need permission once hate is in place. It will impose itself and say, I will take my pound of flesh. That's what darkness does. And I have seen it. Whenever there is hate, it happens because I have tasted it myself. Number two, when we obey this commandment, the reason to stumble will be removed. Oftentimes we stumble. In verse 10 here, it says, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. It's automatic. And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. It's automatic. So the moment I'm able to express my love for my neighbor or for my brother or sister in the faith, I don't have to invite the light. Light will automatically take control and there will be no reason for me to stumble. I will say it, and I, it, this is because a lot of people are online watching. In this past mission that we had in Romania, I noticed one thing that a lot of people do. Whenever there's a problem, they run quickly to the prophetess and, and prophets to tell them what they want to hear. And of course, the more prophecy they get, the more confused they become. 
Because the prophets are not talking from God. They are liars. They are bewitchers. And the reason is what this is happening is that when I look at the life of this individual, their lives are bound by hate. They are literally in darkness. And their stumbling is what chased them to the prophets. Although when there's a tiny problem, they think they are trying to solve it through a prophet. What they don't understand is because they cannot see. In the dark, nobody sees. And so their problem, instead of being eased, becomes more compounded. For us here in America, I don't know if we are prophets. I don't know. But what happens is where hate reigns, darkness will rule. But anyone who lives in the light, there's no reason to stumble. One of the benefits for me as a saint in loving the brethren is that things could not cause me to be stumbled because I can see them. I'm not going to go to that part because there's light. Naturally, when light comes into the dark, what happens? Darkness will what? Flee. And we know who the light is. Number verse 11, bondage and aimlessness. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. It's so simple, self-explanatory. So when hatred enters our heart, it usually fills it with darkness because that is what it does. Unfortunately, such a person is cut off from the joy and the peace of knowing that they are transforming into the image of Christ. Until that hate is purged from their heart, their growth in Christ is stunted, period. It's very important. The moment darkness or hatred enters our heart and darkness imposes itself on us, there is no way we can begin to enjoy the benefit of the joy of salvation, the peace that comes from Jesus Christ, because darkness can retard that aspect of our life. Perhaps one of the sad parts of this passage is that guilt comes alive. First John chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. First of all, I want you to know that your sins have been forgiven. They have been washed away. If you can go back in time, you will not find them because Jesus has washed them away. But when darkness enters into our heart, the guilt of our sin that Christ has purged away will somehow grow up again. It will first of all accuse you. It will make you believe that what is happening in people's life may be because of you. It will make you feel maybe God is still punishing you for the sins that don't exist anymore. And you know what happens to the guilty? They run when nobody is pursuing them. And oftentimes I've seen people, once they get to that place, well, God doesn't have time for me. Well, God doesn't love me. I know God exists, but he doesn't really care about me. And once we get to this place, it's a very bad place. And so as we talk about this virtue, I will, I will see if we'll do the second version, maybe even the third version, to see why this is so important. That I think the virtue of virtues is this. Let us allow brotherly love to manifest in our lives. And not only so, let us love our neighbors just as we love ourselves. Because automatically, our process of sanctification will be free 
to take us to the glory that God expects for us. As I bring this to the end, it will be unfair on my part to assume that it is not a hard thing to love the neighbor. It would be unfair for me sitting here and talking to you to say it is not, it is easy to love the brethren. It is not easy. You know, I have apologized to the people that I used to preach to forgive your neighbor because when it came to my turn to forgive my neighbor, it was very hard to forgive them. I couldn't forgive them. For months, I could not forgive them because it's not easy. But I realized that the more I held on to my unforgiveness, the more darkness rose in me. And my being, my essence, my parts began to become chewed by darkness. And it's not easy. And the one way out of it is to simply ask God, help me. I'd like us to bow our heads and just take time to say to the Lord, if there's any unforgiveness, if there's any bitterness, if there's any hate, if there's any confusion, Lord, I ask for your help. Help me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you again this moment to plead the blood of your son to wash us, to ask for deliverance from every form of hate, every form of bitterness, every form of confusion, unwillingness to forgive the brethren. Lord, we ask for your help in the name of Jesus. Lord, we repent before you. We ask that you take this weight away from us so that our desire to grow and be sanctified and be transformed into the image of Christ will no longer be impeded. Lord, we give you all the glory. Again, Lord, by your own power and your grace, we choose to love our brethren, our neighbors. Lord, we renege on any right that we are holding because we know that you have paid for it all. In your precious and holy name we have prayed. Amen.